chips are becoming the new oil. Oil defined the 20th century and I think chips are going to define the 21st century. Do you think India should build its own foundational models? Promise has been there, but I have to confess in the last 10-15 years, I have not seen the promise be really lived up to. How do you compete with NVIDIA? What makes them successful is CUDA, but what also limits them is really CUDA too. Are you in talks with these companies or any other companies who's building humanoids? For strategic reasons, we have chosen not to engage with China. Is it because you're based in the United States? Nowadays, there's an alphabet soup of new names, but LMMs is really the new category. And broadly, that's going to be the generative AI experience where everything is going to be multimodal. How important a market India is for you? To be succinct, I think India is going to be a global leader in AI and we want to be an enabler of that capability for people here in India. Hi, welcome to another episode of Tech Talk. I'm Pritam. Today we have with us Krishna Langasai, the CEO of Sima AI. Nice to have you here, Krishna. So well, to begin with, uh, can you tell me a bit about Sima AI? And Sima AI makes embedded chips to run AI MLs on the edge, right? So can you give me an overview of the, how the space looks like and where Sima stands in the space? Brilliant. And, and number one, thank you for inviting us. Pleasure meeting you again, Pritam. Um, so Sima AI is all about scaling AI. And we are very passionate about scaling at what we call the embedded edge. So these are applications like robotics, industrial automation, medical, automotive. And we really reflected five years ago that everybody was focused on the cloud or on the consumer experience. We wanted to be a pioneer in building a custom, custom purpose-built platform to scale AI at the embedded edge. Okay. So can you tell me whom do you consider your biggest competitor and how do you see yourself better than them? We end up competing primarily with the NVIDIA. We have other competitors too, and so we end up competing with very large companies like Qualcomm or NXP or TI. But our primary competitor ends up being NVIDIA just because I think we see their software footprint everywhere. Right? Um, and so NVIDIA is an amazing company. So are all these other companies, and so I have competed with them all my life. What we need to do as a startup is really be better than them, and we have picked two areas where we really want to be world class and better than anybody else. And so I think being a student of the embedded market for many years, the two key things that matter is one is ease of use. Uh, and in reality, our customer experience is seen through the lens of software. And we refer to ourselves as a software company that builds our own silicon. So in ease of use and being constructed right for the embedded market, we are better than anybody else today. And we are very proud of that fact that we are better than any of the names of the competitors that I mentioned to you. The second thing is performance per watt. So we, unlike the cloud where performance matters, the edge per power efficiency really matters a lot. So performance per watt, we are consistently 10x of any of our competitors. That really delights our customers. And so one is the ease of use experience, the other one's the performance per watt. No doubts we are better than NVIDIA in all the applications we participate in. But it's not just NVIDIA alone. We compete with a lot of other competitors as okay. well. Uh, can you tell us about the MLPuff we competed with NVIDIA, right? And how do you came out better in that? No, it's, it's a great question. So I think every startup has claims. Unfortunately, I think very few have really lived up to those claims. Yeah. And so what we decided to do was participate at this industry forum called MLPuff where it's really a peer-based review where we compete with an NVIDIA or at a Qualcomm or anybody else that submits the category. In the closed edge category, we submitted to a few benchmarks. And I think we wanted to validate to everybody that we are clearly better than them, right? And so very few startups have really taken this upon themselves. And so there's a lot of skepticism and I can understand it. We wanted to have no doubt that we are better than them. And I've also joked that life doesn't live in benchmarking. And, and unfortunately, nobody just looks at benchmarks and really decides to go with you. But it's a minimum table stake. So we definitely are better than them, not only in performance, but also in power. And that really gives us a good platform. What really matters, obviously, is customers and customer applications. And we are way better than benchmarking in real customer applications. So this is not only NVIDIA, but with the rest of the markets, both startups, but also larger public companies. Okay, so are there any other startup, startups here in the space whom you see are doing really great work? I think there are quite a few startups globally. 
the one large difference between what we do and every other startup seems to be is they're all primarily ML acceleration companies. So to us, we have fundamentally believed from day one that ML is a toolkit and not a product alone. So we integrate ML capability into our chip as an ML SOC. We are solving system problems and system applications, and they're solving a very different problem, which is really ML acceleration, which is a subset of the problem. We see a lot of companies there, and I would say one leading company that we see quite often is a company called Halo. Mm -hmm. Again, they've done a good job for what they're supposed to do, but we fundamentally believe that the experience in the embedded market should be an SOC experience. And in that aspect, I think we directly compete more with the public companies than with the private companies. Okay. So, on the software side, how do you compete with NVIDIA? It's a great question. And again, I mean, NVIDIA just announced the results yesterday. They're an amazing company. And we didn't build a company to compete with everybody else. We end up competing with them because we are wanting to solve customer problems. The one advantage we have had is we have no legacy. I'm a startup. We could really, and I've also been a student of the embedded market for a long time. Mm -hmm. The embedded market is really an open source market. It's all about Linux, OpenCV, OpenCL, and they're used to really everything being ecosystem service because everything is an open standard. Uh, NVIDIA, as to contrast, is really a, primarily a CUDA company, right? And CUDA is not natural for the embedded world. With the cloud, with seven customers, you could really get away with it. But at the edge, it's a Linux world. And they're not going to switch over just mm -hmm. because I think it's something that I think they want to. They'd rather remain who they are. What we have done is instead of fighting gravity, we have actually built a software platform exactly purpose-built for the edge. Everything we do is Linux. Everything we do is OpenCV, OpenCL. And also everything from an ML perspective, we support any ML framework. So we have really thought about our software very differently. And the other key thing we have done in our software is the back end of our software is push button experience. So once you really have ingested your application, people don't have the energy to really optimize network layer by network layer for performance of power. We have really delivered the best in class performance and power with a push button ease of use experience. So that's really why I think we really are seen by our customers is not only on performance per watt, but on ease of use as well. Uh, can we talk a bit more about the next generation chips you're building? And you also talked about running generative AI on these chips, right? So Correct. Can you have some more details on this? Yeah, so we are very excited about our Gen 2 product. We are previewing the product right now. And so I think what I can tell you is it's now going to be on 6 nanometer. Uh, our Gen 1 program was on 16 nanometer. No doubts we'll have a huge advantage in terms of power primarily, but also on um, really improvements in performance as well. Our partners continue to be TSMC, ARM, and Synopsys, so we're really, really appreciative of all the help that they provide us in building this platform. The exciting thing with our Gen 2 program is, in addition to computer vision, which is our focus in Gen, uh, in Gen 1, we are now extending our computer vision focus into a generative AI outlook. It's become very fashionable to call everything generative AI nowadays. Mm -hmm. But what we fundamentally are wanting to do is we call one platform for edge AI. We want to be able to solve for convolutional neural nets or CNNs. We want to be able to solve for vision transformers. But we also want to be able to solve for multimodal large language models. Nowadays, there's an alphabet soup of new names, but LMMs is really the new category, and broadly that's going to be the generative AI experience where everything is going to be multimodal. Every appliance, every device, whether it's a robot, whether it's your AI PC, whether it's a phone, you'd be able to talk, uh, converse, see video, parse inputs, listen, just like you talk to a human being without any latency. And this is going to open up a brand new set of categories, and our focus is really, again, generative AI, but at the edge. So this is where we want to innovate. Very exciting platform, and we are previewing this with everybody. At some point, we'll go public with the availability of our silicon and our software. Okay. So is there a roadmap for third generation chips? We do. We, um, in the one good news with delivering one program is that we have the next program to think about. So both Gen 2 and Gen 3, we're also bringing in automotive focus. And so we did not want to take Gen 1 risk on automotive. It's a startup. We have to be disciplined in what we go do. So Gen 1, we have done a good job. With that confidence and strength, now we're getting into automotive. A lot of OEMs and tier ones globally are very excited. 
and even including in India. And so this week I'm visiting customers here in India and it's super exciting for me that I'm finally back in the town I grew up in. And now I can visit customers here and we could really bring AI capability to a wide range of customers here in India. Can you provide some example? Let's take, um, I mean, you have, you have customers sure. in multiple industries, right? Like <coughs> drones or autonomous yeah. vehicles, right? Any example of yeah, how I, uh, they're using your chip? Absolutely. And so how it has made, made them better? In yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's a great question. So let's take drones, yeah. right? So we are now able to consistently increase flight time by 2x for any drone customer. Mm -hmm. That's really very impressive if you think about it. We're also able to take ML workloads and do complicated algorithms where they could really do runway detection and landing at night. They could do thermal imagery. These are very complicated applications they could not do, right? So what we're able to do is bring new capabilities they've never had before, but they're also able to now increase things like flight time dramatically better compared to everywhere else. That's a drone example. In automotive, today to get what's level two plus in terms of really semi-autonomous driving, it's around 400 to 600 watts that you have to dissipate. And everybody also has an electric roadmap and you turn on your car and you've already lost your range because of the compute. We are able to show a roadmap to everybody to do it at 50 watts. So that's really, really reshaping what can be done. So that reduces the need for thermal management. It improves the safety environment. It also really enables you to drive a very different cost mm -hmm. equation and, and really, I think, bring new capabilities. And maybe third example would be in robotics. Warehouse logistic robots are gonna be everywhere. And now we are seeing the good volume with them. Again, range and being able to 2X the range of available time on the factory floor automation, but also really a dramatically improved human machine interface and safety that's all ML based. And so these are the kind of new capabilities or better of old capabilities that we're doing for all these customers. So do you also see SEMA getting into uh, laptops or even data centers? Data centers, no. Uh, laptops, we are taking a measured outlook. So we want to really specialize in the edge. And so um, there are many companies that are better at solving problems with the cloud. One thing I've learned in my life is not to do too many things simultaneously. So in the area we are in, we are really world class and we want to continue to get stronger and better at that. So we want to remain an edge focused company. Yeah. So edge is something we've been talking about for a while and maybe in the last four or five years, we have seen some developments happening, but do you see currently, right, Microsoft launch a laptop that runs LLM on the edge, right? So do you think now is the time that we'll see more edge developments coming up? Absolutely, and, and so if I were to really look at, there are three key reasons why the edge is now gonna start becoming important. The cloud will be important, the cloud will grow, so I think that will always happen. But there are a few requirements that are gonna need that compute be done at the edge. One is for locality and speed of processing. So there are applications like automotive or maybe AI PCs or maybe even applications like robotics where you don't have the latency of shipping data to the cloud and getting back. You need the data and the analytics to happen right where the data is being collected. So locality is one reason. The second one is privacy and security. That's the huge problem in that I think you cannot really be exposing all data to the cloud or really leaving it for anybody to get access to. So I think that's the second reason why people are gonna to move to more edge applications, particularly in enterprise applications. The third one is TCO. The cloud is not cheap. And most people think the cloud ends up being cheap, but if you really think through it, the total cost of ownership is really, really very difficult and becoming more expensive at the cloud. So for all these reasons, we see a better balance between the edge and the cloud. And I definitely think the next 10, 15 years, the next gold rush in AI will definitely be the edge. What kind of use cases do you see emerging for your second gen chips? Second gen, I think we are gonna go beyond computer vision. Mm -hmm. People would wanna do things with audio, text, video, with everything. Um, and for one reason, I mean, I think it's now become cool to talk about it from a consumer perspective. People wanna build highly accurate systems. And people want to be able to, I'll give you a good example. Today, predictive maintenance mm. is typically done with just audio alone. Mm. Uh, you could use NLP algorithms to do predictive maintenance, but it's pretty poor in its capability. If you combine predictive maintenance 
from an audio perspective along with visual inspection, you have now dramatically increased your capacity for accuracy, for better yield, and for really predicting maintenance better. Right? So that's one example of it. There is a new category of robotics coming together called embodied AI yeah. robotics. Those are all going to be multimodal, and there will be zero latency in talking to them. And they're going to start mimicking a human capacity, not capability, which I think will never happen with AI, but human capacity for really, I think, what they can really interact with, I think, is all exciting. These are all the examples of new capabilities we could do. Is it's moving beyond one modality into being multimodal. You mentioned it won't happen with AI, or you mentioned with the current AI we have. There is so much speculation on AGI, yeah. right? And in that one day, there is human sentient capability that AI could develop. I, for one, don't think that that is going to be happening. And, with and any form of AI? At least for the next 50, 100 years. I don't see a <laughs> rationale for how that's connected. A lot's been written about it. But fundamentally, what we're really doing is really moving into an element of multimodality and really mimicking things that really help us. But the underlying architectures are far, far, far away from being anywhere remotely capable to sentient. Um, and I think there are many, many smart minds that have talked about it. But unfortunately, I think the media hypes the capability, and maybe we've all watched the Terminator movie too much. Uh, but no, I think I don't see a technological element where we mimic human capacity and capability for a very long time to come. You can never say never, <laughs> yeah. but I'm an engineer at my heart, and I just live this every day. I don't see a roadmap to that ever coming in the near future. Yeah. So you mentioned humanoid robots, right? So there are a few companies doing impressive work in the US and some in China as well. So are you in talks with these companies or any other companies who's building humanoids? Absolutely, yeah. So, and I think they all need the core of what we do, right? So they all want the best performance at the lowest power possible. That's one area. They also want it to be multimodal, right? And so particularly the Gen 2 platform, we are very excited. We are engaged with a few, and no doubts we'll be engaging with all of them in the U.S. particularly. For strategic reasons, we have chosen not to engage with China. I think the world of AI and geopolitics and chips are going to be complicated. We are a startup, but I think we are very focused on the applications that are coming together in the U.S. and in Europe. I have no doubts it will be happening in India as well. So don't you think China could be an important market for you? Or is it because you're based in the United States? China is maybe 35, 40% of the global consumption for semiconductors today. AI is a complicated area. And so I think at some point there will be an interesting set of regulations that come together. And as a startup, we need to be careful. I'm not a big company. And we cannot be engaged and then have to really revisit our engagement. So we have so much opportunity in countries like US, in Europe, in India, in Korea, and Japan. And that's a very large market footprint for us. So our current focus for now is to really engage with these geographies. And we'll watch and see what happens in China. But for now, we are staying away from the market opportunity in China. So how important a market India is for you? Very. And, and I have been visiting India in the context of visiting customers for 20 years now. And the possibility of India being a breakout geography and building products in India, the promise has been there, but I have to confess in the last 10, 15 years, I have not seen the promise be really lived up to. In the last year and a half or two, particularly with the team that we have here, and with all the customer meetings we are visiting, everybody is getting on a product focus. Everybody is getting on an AI focus. And we are a company of Indian heritage. So we are very proud of the possibility to really enable all these companies and support them locally here. But I absolutely think that India is going to be a very AI product focused leader globally. I think there will be a lot of innovation on in AI that will come from India. We are engaged with very many facets of the government here in India. We are also looking at various advisory bodies. And we are looking at every opportunity we have to really bring and scale AI within India. But to be succinct, I think India is going to be a global leader in AI, and we want to be an enabler of that capability for people here in India. So you mentioned you're here talking to a lot of customers, right? So what kind of customers are you talking to? You, you mentioned public sector, right? When it comes to private sector, which segment of customers? Absolutely. So we are engaged with almost every 
end application that I told you about, right? So we have exciting robotics customers we're meeting this week, exciting automotive customers we're visiting, exciting industrial automation customers, a lot of smart vision customers, but we're also meeting a few government customers that are in very, 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 very many different uh, government sector applications. So our engagement in India is now relatively nascent, I think a year, year and a half old. We are bringing on rep distribution partners to increase our breadth and reach with customers. And we are starting, we are off to a really good start, but I think one day we'll be touching 100,000 customers here in India. And to really be enabling them all with an AI roadmap is very exciting for me personally. So what are your thoughts on innovation you see happening in India? I think to a certain degree, if I, I really think in the last five years things are changing. Uh, my observation in product companies in India, they were more integrators until recently. I think what I'm really now beginning to see is people are building products for consumption in India. But they're also beginning to build products in India that are for global consumption as well. And I think that's going to be the norm. I think India is definitely going to be a huge market segment, not only for local consumption, but also create products from India for the global market. In terms of AI, I mean, do you think India should build its own foundational models? Ah, this is a huge debate and controversy, <laughs> I'm sure. I would say, in my mind, absolutely yes. And, and, and I think, but the market's also moving really fast. I mean, and I would say there needs to be a deliberate thought process. And I, I worry that people are chasing uh, mirages. And so I every day read news of a new LLM model that's custom tuned for India. And no doubts, I think there is a clear, tangible need for it. But innovation on that needs time, needs scale, but it also needs to be a deliberate, well thought out process. And I worry that there's too much innovation and maybe the rate of innovation also, I think, is something that I think people have to watch out for. And, and news doesn't necessarily make product. Yeah. Uh, that's, <laughs> so that's really the concern I have is, I think there's no dearth for the excitement but I think there needs to be a deliberate, well thought out, long term strategy for how is it going to scale? How is it going to be maintained? How is it going to be deployed? How are the privacy security concerns going to be managed? How will it scale beyond India? Or how will anything else outside of India come in? I think there needs to be a very well thought out, deliberate effort. And I think maybe the innovation is a little too fast ahead of really a deliberate thought process. Okay, Krishna. So India is also trying to get into chip manufacturing, right? We, have, we are very good at chip designing, but manufacturing hasn't happened in India. So what are your thoughts on that? I think this is going to take time. And I think chips are becoming the new oil. Uh, I mean, I think uh, oil defined the 20th century, and I think chips are going to define the 21st century. Every country will want to really own elements of manufacturing. And I think longer term, my belief system is India will be in manufacturing chips. I have no doubts at all. It has the inherent capacity, capability, access, but I also feel like it's gonna take longer than anybody expects. Uh, this is not an easy business to get into. We are partnered with TSMC, and they've been a fantastic partner, and there's a reason why they're the best in class. And they have been at it for a long time. They have really, I think, been fantastic at execution. And it's also a very customer-centric company. Right? I, think, I have no doubts that India will be successful in the long term. How long is it going to take? I think it'll take time. And I think if you have the right patient environment, the right investments, the right government, public sector, private sector partnerships, I think it's going to happen. But I think it'll take much longer than anybody's expectation. OK, so last question, Krishna. So in terms of designing, right, uh, you, ha you have your first and second generation chips. How much of the designing part has been done in India? So I would say at least half of it, the innovation both in hardware and software comes from our team here in India. Um, this has been an amazing team here in India and also in the U.S. We took our first silicon, uh, we, in our language we call A0 silicon production. So our very first attempt, we went to production with zero bugs. Uh, very experienced team here. We know everybody here. We know their families. It's a small company, end of the day. Uh, but I would say that I think I'm enormously proud of our team here in India and our team in San Jose and California as well. And we really don't really see a difference between the talent pool there in India, in India versus the U.S. 
think some companies have really seen India as really a back office for their efforts, but that's never been the case for us from day one. We really look at it as two sites. They innovate and they contribute to different aspects of our product, and we are supremely excited about what this team has done. And I'm always excited to be here. I'm here once every six months, and the team continues to grow and continues to surprise me positively in how much innovation is being built out of India. Thank you, Krishna. Pleasure to have you here. Pleasure. Thank you, Preetam. <laughs> Great questions and yeah. wonderful seeing you again. Yeah.